Nadia, congratulations on the film. I not only the structure, but I, I guess you did a lot of research in, st- in, in terms of archival material. I'm familiar with Larry Flint, but because, you know, before he, he died, he used to go to this hotel in Los Angeles and we used to do all the junkets there. So he was always there every day having lunch. And he was a very, I don't know, I feel close to him in a way. And I yeah, was, was it the peninsula or the Four Seasons? The Four. The Four Seasons, yeah. I had, I had many lunches with him at the Four Seasons. <laughs> yeah, so uh, how, how did you get all this wonderful footage that we've never seen? So I was actually uh, interviewing my uncle, who's a wonderful music producer. His name is Stephen Lindsay. And I was just doing like a family oral history when he just started bringing up the time he was Larry Flint's videographer. He was the producer of uh, what was going to be a documentary on Larry's campaign for president. Um, So the stories that he told about it uh, were just too outrageous for me not to be curious about what happened to the footage. And basically, I mean, he's a music producer and he just stored the footage um, for 33 years until we digitized it. And then I saw, I I watched all of them and I saw that there was really a story that hadn't been told before. And that's when um, I actually met with Larry Flint and he then gave his blessing for me to do the film and then also opened up his own archive and connected me to different uh, different people who were there during the time, and also other journalists who, in, you know, had their own archives, including, you know, like reels and reels of 35 millimeter photographs. So, fortunately, the people who surrounded Larry Flint at the time were uh, were documenting it, but it just never was a story that came out. I think it's a very necessary film because, I mean, uh, we knew about him in the 70s, the 80s, especially when he he was. Uh, satirizing if you want the Reagan administration, but right now it's a, it's a character that uh, not many people, new generations don't, don't know about him because, but I think it's great that you brought it back, brought him back and uh, was he a symbol of uh, freedom of speech? So I think he definitely is a symbol of freedom of speech. And uh, I, I mean, I didn't give Larry Flynn a second thought before I came across the story and the footage. I, I didn't even see the film, Larry, uh, The People versus Larry Flint, even though it was my, on my radar as a kid, but it was like a film that, oh, you can't see that. <laughs> so I, through, through digging into the story and also through my dealings with him and talking with other journalists, he really walked the line. Um, he, he, he walked the walk. He didn't just talk the talk. He would let journalists write things that he didn't necessarily agree with. And it's also testament to his... Uh, very firm belief in the First Amendment that he he also didn't um, require to see anything until the finished film. So there was no approval process with that. He said, make your film and you can have, you know, exclusive access to this archive of mine, but um, he's not gonna meddle. So, so that was essential. He really um, believes in the journalistic uh, integrity of, uh, of people working in the field. I think now it's very important because we're dealing with a whole new slew of thorny issues around freedom of speech, um, including uh, hate speech that masks itself as um, you know, important speech for the First Amendment. I mean, in terms of hate speech, Larry really drew the line. He said that, that any, any speech that would incite violence or cause harm to an individual should not be protected speech. And, um, and today there are there are a lot of battles around that. Um, and also there are issues regarding self-censorship and, um, and fear of being canceled. And I think that if there's any takeaway that I want um, audience members to have from the film is just to gain a little bit of Larry's punk attitude and his firm belief in, uh, in, in speaking your mind and offending, even if, uh, you know, even if you get in some trouble, uh, to self-censor and to censor your thoughts is much more dangerous and really the signs of an illiberal society. I really love the fact that for Larry Flynn, it was very important to unveil the hypocrisy of the, of the, you know, the sectors of this society who unfortunately are in power 
and they're super puritan and hypocritical. You have many examples of, uh, you know, uh, guys who abuse women and they've been abusing women for years. Like right now we have this, uh, the guy from Florida Gates, Gates or with uh, minors and all that. So I think uh, the same guys who wanted to condemn him were the guys who were abusing whatever they were, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you're completely right. Um, something that he, uh, he told me once was just how the places where there's the most amount of um, censorship of pornography and uh, where there's the big, there are the biggest fights against, um, uh, against you know, sexual liberation, those are the places where there's the most amount to hide. And I mean, it's, 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 it's no wonder. So he, I think that he, I don't, I don't know. I mean, he's, he's a very talented um, businessman, but he also felt that if he could, um, with his magazine, redirect sexual energy towards something that's not going to harm anyone, then that's, uh, that's a good thing, you know? And it's, it was a very entertaining magazine. It was, it was almost like um, a political punk humor magazine as well with yeah. naked women. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I loved the, uh, because he was, uh, I would, for me it was very tragic when he got shot. But we don't know who did it or we do, I don't remember. So it was difficult for me not to include the information in the film, but the film really isn't a biopic. So we wanted to stay in the realm of what was known at that time. So he didn't know until many years later when um, this man, Paul Franklin was on death row for many other crimes. He can then confess to being Larry Flint shooter. And this man was um, a white supremacist who was actually um, tied in with David Duke. And he was offended by a racial, an interracial spread in Larry's magazine. Larry put out the first, um, the first like very celebratory, beautiful um, photo shoots of interracial couples and also trans women. And um, not in any kind of derogatory way in like a, a wonderfully like celebratory way. Uh, and so this man was so offended by the shoot that he went down to Georgia where Larry was being tried on obscenity charges and, and shot him, didn't kill him, but um, he wasn't arrested until a few years later and actually ended up shooting and killing 13 more people, all because they violated the race line. And um, just for good measure, he, he did kill um, a couple of Jews. You know, I'm so tired of this hate, hate so much hatred. It's tiresome, but anyway. Uh, yeah, it's very, yeah. very sad. Althea. Althea. I mean, amazing Althea woman. Amazing woman. Film. Yeah, she had she had a very interesting history herself, and they were soulmates. Um, and it really wasn't until they got together that Larry's businesses started to really take off. So she was always pushing him to go further, and she was. She was behind um, a lot of a, a lot of the success of Hustler. Larry had two other magazines before Hustler, and uh, one was called Bachelor Beat, and and these all failed. But really, Althea, the partnership of Althea and Larry, is what made it soar. And um, the women who worked with uh, with Althea also were very important too. So art directors and um, and editors. So that's a that was an interesting thing I found out. So, Nadia, uh, your film is at the Tribeca Film Festival. How important is that for you? Uh, it's such an honor to be here. I mean, they did such an incredible job of bringing uh, a live festival. This is the first big, you know, large live film festival to happen since uh, everything shut down. And the outdoor screenings have been beautiful. Well, I mean, the premiere sounded and looked beautiful. And it's also just such a wonderful festival for documentaries that it's really um, a very cool thing to be included in it. And uh, why did you choose documentary as a way of expressing your story, your need for storytelling, maybe? I think it can take, in, take different forms, but um, documentaries are particularly important because you're really getting uh, 
the characters who lived it and the source material and the archival material allowing that to tell the story as opposed to even writing narration that an actor would read was really important. So I really just wanted to bring the audience back into time and tell them this story that happened through the people who lived it. So as much as we could, we used Larry's own words and we only interviewed people who were actually there. Um, I mean, I love documentaries where there are very smart people being interviewed and they, um, they can talk intelligently about a subject. But for this particular story, I wanted just the people who were on the ground. Uh, my last question, I think he used satire in comedy and he became a comedian in a way like showing up to, to court in a, a diapers or underwear with the American flag. I think it's a brilliant because it's the first amendment, but at the same time, this uptight people get offended. But uh, so he brought a, his body became a, an object of a first amendment and, and a freedom of speech. His whole body was, yeah. right? Like a- Yeah, exactly. He, like, I mean, from being shot to, to you know, lo losing, his, uh, losing his legs and losing his movement because he was exercising his freedom of speech with showing an interracial couple to then using his body, you know, wear, wearing the American flag, wear, putting the shirt on saying, fuck this court in front of the Supreme Court. He was a performance artist and he really put himself on the line. I mean, no other publisher went to prison in America, went to prison for seven months because of his or her first amendment, like belief in the first amendment. I mean, he went because he wanted to protect his source and he wasn't gonna back down. So he really it succeeded in pissing a lot of people off, but the humor was the through line. If I didn't see that, I don't think I would have been interested in the film. If, if I didn't see that Larry and Althea had soul and also that it was so funny. Um, I mean, his, his satire is, is so perfect because he doesn't say, you know, just joking at the end. He lets you, he, he's, he puts it out there and lets you decide. And that's really what makes effective satire. I mean, if you think of Jonathan Swift, it's not like he put a smiley face at the end of a modest proposal. So um, Larry's uh, sense of humor really fucks with people because they don't know what to think. And sometimes they're fooled. And that's part of the, the pleasure of it is the pleasure of being had, the pleasure of believing something, you know, oh, is that Reagan? I'm not quite sure. I don't know. And, and that's the humor. And he was a master at that.